Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today we're going to touch on another RP hot button topic. I'm sure you've all seen this image before. As funny of a meme as it is, I wanted to talk about the actual value of what we're looking at here. This is tentatively called mining the crumbs. If you're not aware of what the back and forth of this conversation is, it's basically whether or not it's worth it to expend the extra pickaxe swings to get the little bits around the edge of a vein that might be hard to encompass in a normal pickaxe strikes radius without, like I said, going out of your way to swing extra times and get every single little bit of the mineral. For the bottom line up front, it depends, but usually no. Before we get into the actual information of the video, I just want to check the RP comments at the door and say, leave the a real dwarf licks every square inch of the cave clean comments at the door, please. Let's take off the dwarf masks and talk like adults. So of the 34 total resources in Deep Rock Galactic, only 12 of them are actually mineable in the sense that they are a vein on the wall that can be mined. Yes, you mine a Jadis, but you can't exactly leave 10% of a Jadis behind whenever you mine it out. So I'm being a little bit generous in terms of what we're actually going to cover in these 12 items. I'm just trying to be as all-encompassing as possible. A few of these you'll be like, okay, come on, like that's kind of a stretch. But just for the sake of the video, anything that you can mine with a pickaxe and only get a small percentage left behind or a gradient percentage of left behind will be included in this section. So the 12 materials we're going to be talking about in this video are oil shale, morkite, dystrum, holomite, bismore, croppa, magnite, umanite, phasianite, nitra, red sugar, and everyone's favorite, good old gold. Now, out of everything I just said, we're going to divide these materials into two separate categories, which I'll define as perishable and permanent. What do I mean by this? Perishable, mineable resources are resources that are not tracked or do not matter after the individual mission is played. So, in this case, Morkite, Oil Shale, Dystrum, Holomite, Nitra, and red sugar are all perishable materials. You can mine 800 Morkite in a mission, you'll get a little bit of extra XP, but there's no number in the rig that says you have 800 Morkite to spend on upgrades. See what I'm saying? And on the other side of that same coin, the permanent mineable items are gold, bismore, croppa, magnite, umanite, and phasianite. These are materials that are counted outside of a mission. So gold is a little bit more abstract in the sense that it is converted to credits at the end of the mission, but I think you take my point. Something that you did in the mission and the variable amount that you mined produced a numerical result outside of that individual mission that will persist forever or until you spend it in this case. Before we get too deep into anything, I wanna talk about good mining practices. This is a little interwoven with the bottom line up front, which is that you usually shouldn't be getting every little bit of every single vein you find, so forgive me if my thoughts get a little bit tangled here. When it comes to perishable, mineable resources, you just need to get enough to get yourself to the finish line, and that's the simplest way to put it. Getting 160 nitra in a mission is great. Getting 180 nitra in a mission is relatively pointless. Getting 200 nitra is even more pointless. Getting 239 nitra is ultimately pointless. In the same way, massively overmining Morkite will get you that little bit of extra XP, but if you care at all about your efficiency and you're watching this video, it probably isn't really important to you to get that extra 40 to 80 XP from a couple extra inventories of Morkite. Oil shale is by far the best example of this as no one's sitting around pickaxing extra oil shale because it doesn't do anything for you. It's just about getting enough into the canister. I hesitate to do it even include oil shale just because you don't really mine it with a pickaxe yourself, but it does kind of apply under the same general umbrella of everyone will give up on a vein of oil shale once it starts to just be little slivers around the edge and they can tell that okay, this isn't going to be enough for me to fill this canister, so I might as well just go find another vein right now. And I think oil shale is a really good example, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to include it. 
When it comes to perishable, mineable resources, think of everything as oil shale. Whenever you're looking at a vein of Morkite in the final cave of a Morkite mission, you can generally look at it and say, okay, that looks like 20 Morkite over there. I need 40. So I'm just going to go for this big vein of Morkite right next to me. On a cosmic scale, this is the theoretical process for not mining crumbs. The likelihood that I'm going to be 0.9 nitra short of my next resupply is statistically and categorically very low. And over the course of all the missions you play, that statistical chance makes it worth it just to ignore those little crumbs of nitra. Someday you are going to end up at 79 nitra and have to go find another vein, but the 100 missions you played before that point where you didn't waste your time mining those little crumbs of nitra is the payoff. That one time you have to go get a vein, it will suck, but that time saved in the previous missions is where the payoff is. This conversation gets a little more complicated when we start talking about permanent materials. Everyone knows my stance on gold at this point, but I'm still going to talk about it like a neutral party. Especially since gold is a two-hit material, your goal should be to get the majority of it as quickly as possible. I'm about to extrapolate a lot of numerical information, so please just stick with me. I know it's not completely accurate to the way the DRG actually plays, but it is scalable in the same factor, so please stick with me. If a vein of gold is exactly 110% the width of your pickaxe carving radius while you're mining, you're essentially going to have to double the amount of pickaxe swings you take to mine that vein. Veins are twisty, strange shapes, they have variable depth, width, height, everything plays a lot of a factor into this, but for this example we'll visualize that 110% width vein of gold flat across the ground. If we want to get every single possible speck of that vein, we have to mine the top and the bottom to overlap in the middle to get the entire vein. This means for every horizontal one pickaxe strike that we want to go, we have to do two vertically on top of each other, effectively doubling the amount we have to mine. Let's just say this vein of gold is 40 gold for a nice round number. And for the sake of simplicity, we'll say that we mine across the top layer of the vein and come back across it on the bottom, perfectly mining all the gold in 20 tile breaks. So this required us to do 40 pickaxe strikes. Let's say those 40 pickaxe strikes each took one second. I know they don't. This is that numerical assumption I was talking about. So in 40 seconds, we performed 40 pickaxe strikes, which got us 40 units of gold. Now let's take a more realistic example of how we actually mine whenever we're leaving crumbs behind. Rather than going for everything at the top and bottom edge, ensuring we overlap in the middle, we're just going to run our pickaxe directly down the middle of the vein. This means that it takes us 10 tile breaks or 20 pickaxe swings to break the vein right down the middle, leaving a little bit on the top and bottom. For the sake of numerical assumption, let's just say that we miss 10% of the gold because we left that behind. In reality, it would actually be a lot less than 10%, but just for the sake of the situation and playing devil's advocate in favor of mining crumbs, we're going to assume that it's 10%. So it took us 20 seconds to do 20 pickaxe swings to mine this vein of 40 gold. However, we missed 10% because of our quote-unquote sloppy mining. This means that we got 36 gold in 20 seconds, rather than 40 gold in 40 seconds. I don't know about you, but that seems like a significantly better result and better payoff for your time. We'll look at some actual examples in-game of this to be completely transparent, but generally the time scaling is the same. If you're going to swing your pickaxe twice as many times for that last little inkling of result from a vein, then yeah, you're going to spend twice as much time for definitely not twice the result. So with the gold example squared away, let's talk about some of the other permanent minerals because they have a pretty significant discrepancy from gold. Aside from croppa, most crafting minerals that are mined in this fashion are vertically coming out of the ground. Bismore, I don't know about vertical. It's a cube that comes out of the ground. Magnite is a stick that generally protrudes from the ground. Uminite is the same way. And phasianite is a stick that protrudes from the wall. If you spent more than 15 minutes playing DRG, you probably know that the best way to get at anything that's protruding from the ground is to break it off at the stem and let the game's engine collapse the rest of the item 
into a pickupable item. So whenever we're talking about mining permanent minerals, the only things that are really considered in a way that would leave crumbs behind is croppa and gold. Because much like gold, croppa is in the wall and it requires some sort of thought process in how you mine it. Bismore, magnite, umanite, and phasianite, you cut off from the surface they're attached to and generally that yields basically zero crumbs at all. Now, all this being said, I know that if you have zero bismore in the bank and you see those two tiny little corners of bismore left behind in the ground, you're gonna go for them. Like, realistically, no amount of mathematical information that I can pitch to you will change your mind on that, but as soon as you're not, you know, at the bottom 1% of the totem pole, it's probably in your best interest to take two chunks out of a piece of bismore and leave any scraps left behind. I find that bismore is the most egregious with this as it's basically just a little bit bigger than the pickaxe radius of the player's swing, so it tends to leave little pieces behind if you go through the middle of it. But like I said, in general, the little pieces are worth leaving behind, but I don't think you're going to, so not gonna waste too much of my breath on that one. So much like with our gold example, if we want to talk about the effectiveness of mining perishable minerals, we have another consideration to make, which is the breakpoint in which those perishable minerals are useful to us. If we're playing a 200 Morkite mission, our goal is to get 200 Morkite. Anything beyond that is unnecessary, and for most people, isn't a priority. So if you have two more caves to go through, and you have 110 Morkite in the bank, it's probably not in your best interest to lick those veins clean. Generally, the final cave in a Morkite mission is gonna have more than half the Morkite in the complete mission. That and you have more than enough Morkite over the course of a total mission. With this informed decision in the back of your mind, you generally don't wanna be too precise when mining Morkite. If we go back to that same 40 gold vein example, of course it's gonna be half the time because Morkite is a one-hit mineral, but if we're looking at a vein of 40 Morkite, and we only need 20 more Morkite, there's no reason to be in any way precise or to mine double wide on that vein. Go down the middle, take the meat of the vein, and move on. Dystrom and Holomite are incredibly good examples of this because they have a very low threshold for completion. Holomite can fit the entire objective into your pocket. Every stick of Holomite is between five and seven, sometimes eight if you're lucky, in how much it will yield for you, so generally you mine the whole thing, but Holomite is a great example of skipping whenever you have enough of everything. That's not necessarily the topic of this video, as not leaving crumbs behind isn't really relevant to completely skipping a mineral, but I digress. Dystrom requires you to have two and a half full inventories of the material. So that's a very dynamic choice to make whenever you're mining Dystrom. Technically, the best way to go about getting Dystrom, assuming that you have the default carrying capacity, is to get 33 or more at a time. In pretty much every scenario, you're going to have to find at least two more veins of Dystrom to complete the objective. No amount of extra Dystrom you're going to mine there is going to get you to 40, which, like I stated before, isn't really super relevant when it comes to Dystrom, as you need three inventories of 33 or two and a half inventories of 40 to complete the objective anyways. So don't waste the extra time going for extra material that realistically you're gonna have to get later on anyways in a much more dense area. The meat or the heart of another vein is significantly, significantly more enticing than staying behind and cleaning up scraps on a vein. Nitro is a very dynamic one, but let me try to explain the thought process. Early on when you're playing the game and you're told that Nitra is the living blood of a mission and that if you run out of ammo, you die and that Nitra is the only way to get ammo, you're probably going to be pretty concerned with getting every single iota of it that you can. But as you progress through the game, you'll start to understand that if you do not get 80.0 Nitra, that Nitra isn't useful to you. If in theory, if you went into a cave and there was only 75 Nitra in it, all that time that you spent mining Nitra doesn't do anything for you. So to that effect, you can start to make more informed decisions as you play more of the game, and if you're mining a vein of Nitra and it's only giving you around 20 or so, it's not worth cleaning up that extra 0.1 and trying to get to 21, because you're going to have to go find another vein of 20 to finish filling your pockets, or another vein of 60 to finish the resupply. I'm not going to tell you to be sloppy 
with mining nitra. Don't leave five or six units behind. But a lot of people will have a knee-jerk reaction whenever they see one or 1.5 nitra left on the wall of, oh my god, we're gonna die, we're not gonna have enough ammo. But try to explain to them, or yourself if you think that way, that one nitra doesn't matter. 80 nitra matters. Like I said before, you will get into a situation where you have 79 nitra sometime, and you might have to shamefully go back to that vein and grab that last 0.5 in order to get your number to round up. But that's gonna happen one in a hundred missions, so 99 out of 100 times, it's worth just doing a decent job and moving along. Now before we wrap up, I wanna go over a couple of loose things that I came across while I was coming up with this video. Let's talk about Driller. I'm sure when everybody was first starting out, they went up to veins of minerals and tried to mine them as Driller. Well, turns out this kinda works if you drill behind the vein and disconnect it from the wall. This works best, in my opinion, with small veins and mineral types that are on the floor like holomite or umanite. With small veins, you can easily just dig a tunnel behind them and they'll snap off. That quality of life starts to fall off whenever you start looking at bigger veins that require you to either dig a second tunnel above, below, or looking up and down to make sure you cut off the vein from the wall. This can be subverted by drilling a rough tunnel behind a vein of nitro per se, and then manually pickaxing off the parts that are connecting it to the rest of the terrain, but in my experience this is just a little bit inconsistent and fickle, and it would be remiss not to talk about C4 and EPC before we pass over Driller. EPC in the Thin Containment Field mod can easily mine down minerals that you might not be able to get to otherwise, and in a way this tends to leave crumbs quote unquote behind as you rarely hit the entirety of large veins when using Thin Containment Field. Think of leaving crumbs behind in this same sense. It's just not worth the effort to shoot a second Thin Containment Field bubble at it. And if you take ammo on satchel charges and get two per resupply and start with four, you can usually get away with quickly mining an awkward vein of nitro or getting some extra gold with a satchel. Now, one of the major reasons not to leave crumbs behind is the visual illusion that it can cause for other players. This isn't so much of an issue with things like Nitra, as it's very hard to see if the area isn't lit, and obviously if the area isn't lit, this isn't going to be an issue. The main points where this becomes an issue is with things like Morkite and Kroppa. These are self-illuminating materials. Whenever a player looks at them, even in pitch blackness, these materials are lit. You can see them. So whenever you leave behind a roughly vein-shaped pattern of crumbs, a player looking at it from a distance can easily be misled into thinking there's still a full vein there, and whenever they run over to it and look at it again, they're going to be a little bit disappointed that it's just a shell. So, you know, use your best judgment. If something looks like it's going to end up in a dark corner of a cave, you might want to clean it up a little bit more. Especially if you're playing with newer players who might be deceived. Now, a pretty nuanced one. Talking about sandblasted corridors and dense biozone. Sandblasted corridors is kind of undercutting the entire crumb conversation as you can one hit the terrain around the vein to mine it just as quickly, if not faster in the case of things like gold. So if you're ever having a hard time getting your pickaxe around a whole vein of gold and sandblasted, take a row, preferably from the top or the bottom, and then use the terrain adjacent to the side that you didn't take to instantly one-hit mine all of the edge material that's in close proximity to your pickaxe. Now you might be asking, why do you bring up dense biozone if it's not one-hit terrain, it's two-hit? Well, dense biozone actually has a bit of a weirdness to it where the carving radius of digging terrain in dense biozone is actually larger than every other biome. This can easily be demonstrated and seen if you try to dig through dirt in dense biozone, you'll notice that you have to dig a two pickaxe block tall hole to get through. But if you go through the actual dense biozone terrain itself, it's actually just big enough that you can squeeze your character through with a single terrain break. So other than the fact that you can more easily mine around the edges of veins because of the larger carving radius, you can also go through dirt slightly faster by going underneath dirt, or around the edge, or over the top. I find directly down and underneath is the most efficient way, but your mileage may vary. Try it out for yourself, it's quite useful. Now, I didn't really realize how bad this next point was until I actually looked at the wiki. Would you like to guess how many missions require you to mine items into your inventory other than Nitra in order to complete them? 
Aside from Dystrom and Holomite, which are secondary objectives which can appear intermittently, the only mission type in the game that requires you to mine something that goes in your pockets is actually Morkite mining. I mean, it makes sense now that I'm looking at it, but I just never really realized that there was no mission in the game other than mining that wasn't centered around mining. And sure, you get Nitra and maybe Gold and all the other mission types, so the strategy stays the same, but what we're going to talk about right now is inventory breakpoints. And what I mean by that is how much does it matter how much of a mineral you have in your pockets at once. Now the easiest example for us to talk about here is resupplies. You need exactly 80 nitro, which is exactly two of your default carrying capacity inventories of nitra in order to call a resupply. So putting mining missions to the side for a moment, the only thing that really matters in a mission is how much nitro you can stuff into your pockets at once. I know we're kind of getting away from the crumbs topic, but I'll bring it back around, I promise. For pretty much everyone that plays this game, the main goal whenever you start a mission is to figure out what's going on with the objective and get a resupply ready to go, because obviously you want to have one ready before you need it. So while still on the topic of inventory breakpoints, I want to bring two other factors into this. The mineral pouches upgrade on the armor and deep pockets passive perk. Taking mineral pouches by itself first, how much does it really matter to carry 45 minerals instead of 40? Well, whenever we consider that basically all that matters when it comes to the exact amount of minerals that we can stuff into our inventory is nitra, it really isn't a huge impact because making two inventories for full capacity for us be 90 instead of 80 doesn't have a huge relevancy until you consider one thing. The mistake that I find a lot of people make is realizing they're not going to be able to finish a vein of nitra and not cutting it off the wall. So not completely filling their inventory and breaking the rest of the vein down so that it can be picked up when you run back by. Some people do it, some people don't, but in this hypothetical situation where someone realizes, oh, I don't have enough inventory to get the rest of this nitra. They stop mining at 35, 38, 39.9, doesn't really matter. It's not a cardinal sin or anything because they're probably just going to come back for it, but what you can do in your situation adjacent to them to make up for this potential shortfall where maybe they get sidetracked from finishing that vein and your team is left with just 39 nitra in the bank. If you come along with 40 nitra and deposit it, then you're going to be met with that dreaded 79 and you're going to think, oh no, we should have been mining crumbs. In reality, there's a much more effective way to counter this, which is taking mineral bags on the armor. This way, even if you don't completely fill your inventory, say you only get 41, you're still able to meet that shortfall that your teammate potentially left and fill up to that even 80. That and I find that even on Hazard 5, the one second faster shield recharge or faster shield recharge rate isn't all that impactful in my experience. My experience being said though is at a decently high level of play, so if you find that you could make use of that slight extra advantage to your shield in the first tier on your armor, there's no need to take mineral bags. Just try to be conscientious about absolutely filling yourself with nitra to the brim before pulling off of whatever you're mining to go back to the mine head. And if you take the mineral bags upgrade, then you don't even have to worry about this potential shortfall as you'll have up to that five extra that your team may or may not need. Now, to stack on top of that, let's talk about deep pockets. Deep pockets is pretty much the same thing. It's a passive perk, but instead of adding five, it adds 15 extra inventory slots to every mineral type. This means you can get up to 60 nitra in this case. Talking about nitra alone for a moment, this doesn't really change much as far as the first resupply is concerned. Don't get me wrong, fitting more minerals in your inventory is a great quality of life change. But in my opinion, there's really no great, like, mission-changing, mission-winning, life-saving benefit from deep pockets. Because you won't feel the effect of those fewer trips to and from a deposit point until you get to your second resupply you're still going to have to make two trips out, air quotes, in order to get your first resupply. Even if you fill your inventory all the way up to 60, deposit, and then you'll still have to go out again to get another 20 nitra. This is effectively the same thing as if you had the default carrying capacity of 40. You deposit 40 and then have to go back out to get another full inventory. 
there's certainly a conversation to be had here, but with a lot of variability and just different generation in the cave, and sometimes it's easier to deposit with just 40, sometimes you won't even find 40 between opportunities to deposit, it's just too nuanced of a topic for me to tackle in a video that's already running a little bit longer than I want it to. So to put it shortly, Deep Pockets doesn't really change anything as far as your general mission progression and Nitra gathering. It can be useful on mining missions though, especially the longer ones where you're moving massive amounts of minerals. If I had anywhere that I could fit in a potentially useful passive perk in all of my builds across all of my classes, I definitely would. But as it stands, there's really just no room in any of my builds to fit a perk that may or may not come in handy for me. I just, I just can't make it happen. I'm sorry. If there's any takeaway that I can get the hardcore mine everything crowd to get from this video is that if you're going to be super thorough, stingy, and effective about mining anything or everything in the game, Nitra should be the main thing you care about. Because like I said, there is a tangible effect that missing that one Nitra can have very, very rarely. Missing one or two units of gold is irrelevant on a fundamental level. Just play another mission. If you're going to fail a mission because you only have 79 Nitra, then I have a much harder time telling you to get over that one. That's the situation in which you can be like, hey, we needed it. We only came out of this mission with exactly 80 Nitra for that resupply that we desperately needed. So there's a very real situation in which you might be right about that. Does it happen more than once every lunar cycle? Not really. But I concede that it is a possibility and it can impact your gameplay. So if you're going to be super thorough about mining anything, make it be Nitra. As always, thank you for watching and have a nice day.